Again, we're glad to have you with us this morning. Here at Riverside Christian Church, we began this uh, new year uh, with a theme, God Jesus. Not so much as a New Year's resolution, but as a goal for us as we begin the year and striving to learn all we can about the Lord Jesus. And we're in a little mini-series right now that's entitled, Jesus is the Greatest Friend We'll Ever Find. And this morning in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25, we're going to discover that he is a friend of the fearful. What kind of things are you fearful of? I believe you'd agree from the moment we wake up in the morning until we lay our head on a pillow at night, odds are we're probably going to be experiencing some time of anxiety or fear during our day. Now, I understand that when we're born, we really only have two fears. That is, the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. And all of our other fears are learned and developed as we go through life. What are you fearful of? Others like me are afraid of spiders and snakes. And there are some that have phobias about germs. Of course, traffic can be a problem, and I'm not referring to our own ability to drive. I'm talking about the other guy, because we never know what he's going to do. Or perhaps some of the things that bring you fear and anxiety would be those red and blue lights that are flashing in your rearview mirror. Or perhaps you're a little bit claustrophobic and you just really don't do crowded elevators. Perhaps you're afraid of heights. I know some that are fearful of flying because they just don't understand how they can get all that tonnage of metal up into the sky and have it soaring across. I love the story of a little old lady that had flown on a particularly bumpy flight. And as they were exiting the plane and the pilot was out to greet everybody, she walked up to the pilot and looked up at him and glared, and she asked him this question. Did you land this plane, or were we shot down? Well, whether it's flying or bugs or heights or loud noises or whatever, there is a tendency for us to fear certain things. And certainly these days, there's the added fear of contagious germs from the COVID-19 virus, which has, I guess, superseded any former fears that we would have had, like nuclear holocaust or global warming, terrorist attacks, carjacking, sex trafficking, unequal, uh, unstable stock markets. I know some who fear natural disasters, tornadoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and fires and floods. I grew up in the Texas Panhandle. And I really, there's a part of me that just enjoys a good old thunderstorm. In fact, up home we used to call them thunder boomers uh, because they, there were times that they could just really shake the house. And I love the story of the little child. Mom and dad are trying to tuck their child into bed at night. And it's raining and it's storming. And as it would lightning and thunder, the child would be scared. But mom and dad said, you'll be fine. You just sleep in your bed, and Jesus will take care of you. Well, just about that time, there was a big old clap of thunder, and just shook everything in the room, and the child looked at him and said, I know Jesus is going to take care of me, but right now, I need me a Jesus with some skin on. Other people fear sicknesses and disease, and the apprehension that comes from going to a doctor's office and hearing words like malignant, inoperable, terminal, life-altering. And certainly there are many this morning that are fearful of the future. What does tomorrow hold for me? Once this quarantine is all over, what then? Especially for those that have lost jobs and have been... Uh, financially set back big time through all this. 
I'm very certain that our new normal is going to be very different than the ways that we have previously lived life. Well, no matter what our fears might be, the question that must be asked is, how are we going to deal with our fears? How are we going to handle all of this stuff? So I invite you to share with me in a quick word of prayer as we ask the Lord to speak to us and we can be attentive and listen and apply some principles from His Word to our life. Pray with me, please. Father God, as we get into Your Word, I ask that Your Spirit would speak clearly to us. Father, we do know that fear is a liar. And You know that uh, we are facing unprecedented times and we don't really understand. Our hearts and our minds at times are overwhelmed with uncertainty and fear. Please find us faithful as we place our trust in you. Speak to us deep to deep, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to do a little quick test right off as we begin to look at four personality types to see which one we might fall into as it pertains to how we deal with the fears in our life. This first personality type would be called the volcano person. That's a person that looks just as solid as a rock on the outside, appears as though everything's just fine and nothing could shake them. Yet on the inside, they are churning and approaching eruption because of all of the internal anxieties. Anybody fit in that category? The second personality type would be called the talk show host. You know, whenever they're afraid and fearful about something, they immediately want to talk it out with whoever they can. They'll talk about the subject with anyone and everyone. You know, pull the audience, bring in the experts, ask everyone on Facebook what they think. They're going to check with Siri or Alexa. They're going to be Googling information in order to find what they can find and then play out every imaginable scenario to determine what's going to happen. Anybody like that? Fall into that category? Closely related to that is this third idea, the personality type, which we would call the imaginer. Kind of a Disney term, I guess. This is the type of person that begins to think and imagine every possible situation. Sorting out things that really don't exist, kind of like a zombie apocalypse or whatever, as well as everything that could possibly go wrong. And some of us do that with our fears, don't we? At the outset of that first breeze of trouble, one little thing comes along and we start to expect and anticipate that everything else is going to fall apart like a house of cards. And we ask, what else? What else can possibly go wrong? Anybody fit in that category? And this, first, this uh, fourth personality type, I refer to as the computer bug. In other words, if, if one little thing comes into the system, if, if there's one little glitch, one little hiccup, one little bump in the road during the day, the whole program gets shut down. This is a person that becomes so fearful that they cannot eat, sleep, work productively, or perform normal life functions because of this computer virus. And it causes fear to totally and absolutely shut them down. And it results in relentless worry. And you know well that worry does not take away tomorrow's troubles, but it does indeed take away today's peace. Well, no matter what it is that frightens us, we've got to come to grips with the fact that there are going to be some fears and frightening storms in our lives. They are inevitable, and no one's exempt. And whether we're in one right now or just coming out of one, the reality is we will eventually be in another storm of some kind before long. Again, it's inevitable. Jesus told his followers, in this world, you will have trouble. 
And so the question before us this morning, how am I going to deal with my fears? When the pressure of the performance review hangs over our head, when the phone rings and the doctor says, we need to run some more tests. When your spouse comes in and says, we need to have a serious talk. Or when we're looking at our retirement plan and it just doesn't seem financially feasible. Or when we realize that we are suddenly single again and we walk out of the funeral home alone and fear paralyzes us. Or when we learn that our position is no longer essential and we're just told good luck how are we going to deal with that kind of stuff because it does happen it does happen well in Luke chapter 8 we find a story of Jesus and the disciples on the Sea of Galilee the storm comes up the disciples are scared to death Jesus calms the storm and it's my prayer that as we study through this, we will see indeed that Jesus is the greatest friend we're ever going to find. And especially he is a friend of the fearful. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And so they got in the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where's your faith? He asked his disciples. And the Bible says here, in fear and amazement, they ask one another, who is this? Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Now I want us to notice that after this incredibly frightening storm, the disciples have now discovered something that brings more fear into their life than the storm did. And that's this guy in the boat with them. It's Jesus. And this morning I want to be able to share with you some navigational guidelines that will help us in dealing with the fears of our lives uh, rather than allowing fear to paralyze us. So if you want to take some notes, three, three points right quick. Number one, navigational guideline number one, and this would be good advice for anybody, but... Uh, even especially for kids that are getting ready to graduate high school and get into life as we know it. Number one is this, we have to be prepared to face some storms that we're not going to be able to handle. Have you found that true? It seems as though in our American culture that we readily think that we can fix just about anything. And if we can't fix it, we'll find somebody who can and we often get frustrated and bewildered when we're confronted with things that seem unfixable. We'll tell our doctor, just give me a shot, write me a prescription, give me some pills, I'll, I'll feel better. But when the doctor says, you know, there's really nothing we can do, it forces us to come to the realization that there are some storms that we can't fix we may not be able to handle this current situation, COVID-19. Who saw that coming, really? Businesses are closed. Schools are closed. We can't go anywhere. Many are faced with no income. And there's not a daggum thing we can do about it except be still and know that He is God and that He is in control. And to realize that God yearns to do life with us every moment of every day. And now that we have a little bit more time on our hands, I believe he would be saying, let's use some of this time and spend it together. I want you to take advantage of some of this stillness and just be in my presence. And it's not so much that we're seeking God's hand of blessing, but we need to be seeking his presence knowing that there is peace 
in His presence. Again, it's essential, it's imperative in life that we be prepared to face some storms that we cannot handle. Some of you, like me, deal with seasonal allergies. Or even just the common cold. It can frustrate us because there's no quick fix for that. We just have to let it run its course. And any time that we are faced with a situation that is bigger than our potential power to handle it, it becomes very frustrating. And quite often we forget that that can happen in life. Well, concerning our story here in the Bible, I think it's interesting to note that there are four fellows in that boat that are professional fishermen. Now understand, they've seen their share of storms before. And this is a storm that scares them, so that's an indication that it's one big storm. When you study the area, the Sea of Galilee sits in a basin 685 feet below sea level. And it's surrounded by mountains some 2,000 feet above sea level. And so when the wind comes over those mountains and dips down in that water, it often creates amazing storms that come about. And the word that's used here, it says a squall came up. Now this is a word that's used to describe hurricane force winds. So this is a big this is a big storm. I mean, it was off the charts on the Doppler radar. They didn't see this coming in their five-day forecast. So it caught them by surprise, and they were terrified. They're in the midst of a storm that was perhaps bigger than anyone they've ever been in before. And let me ask this question. What do we do? What do we do when a situation comes into our life that is bigger than we can handle. What do we do? So often in life when people encounter a storm, usually of their own making, a storm that is too big or too scary, they choose to lie or cheat or steal or hide things, cover up facts. They like to manipulate others through guilt. They try to raise their voice and force issues through, but Basically what happens when a storm comes about that's too big for us to heavy, uh, too big for us to handle, we begin to do what comes naturally. These things that I just listed. And the Bible lets us know that when we're going to react to something and face it with gut instincts and whatever, that that's usually not the best way to go about doing it. In fact, the proverb writer says, there is a way that seems right to a man in our limited knowledge and wisdom. It seems right, but in the end, it leads to death. Catch what Jesus said as far as living by his word and putting his word into action in our lives. These words I'm speaking to you are not mere additions to your life. Homeowner improvements to your standard of living. These words are foundational words. Words to build your life on. And if you will work these words into your life, you're going to be like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it because it was built to last. But if you use these words of mine just in Bible studies and don't really work them into your life, you're like a dumb carpenter who builds his house but skipped the foundation. And when the swollen river comes crashing in, it collapses like a house of cards. It's a total loss. Friends, the truth of the matter is whenever storms come into our lives, it should cause us to realize we're not as big, we're not as wise, we're not as talented, we're not as crafty as we think we might be. There are bigger situations in our lives, and many of them we can't fix, and we can't handle. And so therefore we've got to consider 
who we're going to turn to. Navigational guideline number two. Who are we going to turn to? We've got to make sure Jesus is part of our crew. Now most generally, when we're in a serious storm in life, we begin to assess who's in the boat with us. We have a crisis that comes into our life, and what do we do? We contact our family and our friends, and we begin to receive support from them. We are assessing who's got our back, who's with us, who's supporting us. But we also begin to assess who's not in the boat with us. Who is it in my life that's really just dead weight and taking up space? Who is it that has their own agenda for how I should be living my life? Who is it that when, when the time comes never really shows that they even care? And I think that's where the disciples are in this situation. They're scared to death. They're bailing out water as fast as they can to save their own skin. And they are assessing who's on our team and who's not. And looking around, they begin to question, well, where's Jesus? Isn't he on our team? Isn't this his team? Why isn't Jesus helping us here? And stuff like that happens to us, doesn't it? We might be in a similar situation and our imagination begins to run wild. We begin looking around the boat that we're in and we begin to assess who we think is worthy to be around and who's pulling their weight. And we also realize who it is that's just dead weight. We want to know who it is that really loves us as we also realize who it is that could really care less. And I think that's what these guys are dealing with right now. And, and it's so bewildering about our imaginations. At times we begin thinking things that are not true at all. Have you found that to be real? But nonetheless, we begin to believe them. And because of our fears, we're so easily prone to imagine crazy things. And our imagination can take us in a variety of different directions. And at times when we're afraid, we begin to think, I, I'm just all alone. Nobody knows how I feel. No, nobody's with me. Nobody cares. And maybe that's what the disciples are thinking right now. They're scared. They're thinking the worst. They're soaked to the core. They're afraid they're about to die. And so they finally address the one particular crew member who doesn't seem to be pulling his weight at the time. And basically they're doing what we're guilty of. They couldn't see that Jesus was involved in the situation, so they thought he didn't care. They presumed that since he was just sleeping through this, that they didn't matter to him. And because he was not actively involved in doing anything, they thought for the moment that he just doesn't care. And you know, as I read this story, I think it's interesting. You notice that they had to wake him? They had to wake him up. He wasn't aroused by the storm, but he was easily moved by the voices of his children. He arose, he saw what was happening, and in essence said, Hush! Be quiet! Be still! That's enough! And the wind and the waves calm down. And now imagine these dripping wet disciples are now dropping their buckets and their jaws, scared to death over what has just happened before their eyes. They're now more afraid of the guy in the boat than they were about the storm. And Jesus turns and looks at them. And he said, where's your faith? Where's your faith? And I do not believe for a moment that he's saying to them, you know, if you had the faith, this storm would have never come. Nor do I believe he ever says to us, if you'd had faith, you wouldn't have gotten sick. If you had faith, you wouldn't have lost your job. If you had faith, your loved one wouldn't have died. Jesus doesn't say things like that. 
I don't believe he is saying, if you only had the faith, you could have stilled this storm. You could have prayed out of this situation. Jesus doesn't say stuff like that. But there are groups today that teach and preach that kind of misleading message. Instead, I believe what Jesus is saying is simply this. Come on, guys. Come on. After all we've been through together, You've been with me. Remember, remember that uh, young man that died and we met the funeral procession and I brought him back to life? Remember that? Remember that blind man? Blind from birth and I restored his sight. Remember? You were there with me. Remember that guy whose body was covered with leprosy and, and I touched him and, and he was healed. Remember that fella whose legs were all crippled up and when I healed him, he began to dance and sing praise to God. Remember that, guys? Check my track record. This is me. You can trust me. Jesus showed them that he had power over the natural world by calming the storm. And we know that he had power over the supernatural world as he cast out demons. And we can step back and say, well, that's fine for Jesus to do those kind of things because there's nothing we can do about that kind of stuff. But what makes folks really nervous is when Jesus comes in and says, let me have your life. I want you to trust me with your life. Because we begin to think, <laughs> uh, wait a minute. You, you make me a little bit nervous, Jesus, because I, I really don't know your intentions for my life. I, I don't know what you want to do with my life, and I, I feel more comfortable calling, calling my own shots and trying to figure out my own destiny, and yeah, I understand that you've said that you know the plans you have for us, and they're, they're not to harm us, but to prosper us, and to give us a hope and a future, but I, yeah, I don't know, Jesus. And again, I think that's where the disciples are. They're really wondering just who this Jesus is, and they're struggling to determine if they really can Trust Him with their lives. And I think a lot of people are like them. We understand God's power. We understand Jesus is God's Son. That He has incredible power as well. But this whole idea of just surrendering our lives over to Him and letting Him exercise His power and control of our lives, that just, that just sometimes scares us to death. There's so many people today that believe as long as they're good, as long as they mind their manners and say grace and practice the golden rule that God's going to bless them and everything's going to be okay. But as soon as things start to turn south for whatever reason, they start to think, oh great, what's, what have I done? What have I not done? Somehow God's ticked off at me. God's mad. Maybe I shouldn't have honked at that person on the road. Maybe I shouldn't have hoarded all that toilet paper. Maybe I should have been nicer to my neighbor. God's mad at me. He's going to get me now. And there's so many people that are fearful of making God mad. One author shares this. Some of us believe that God is almighty. He's omnipotent. And He can do everything. Some believe that he's all wise, omniscient, and may do everything. But to believe that he is all loving and will do everything, that's when we draw back. That's where we begin to think, I, I just don't know. In other words, we don't trust ourselves, and we don't really trust each other. So how in the world are we supposed to trust God? And I think that's where the disciples were right now. Can we really trust Him? Can we really trust Him? 
In church, I just have to share this. I, through 40 plus years of ministry, I have been with different people that face certain storms from time to time that are just huge. Easily too big to handle. And very much so that they can't be fixed. And I wonder how these people deal with the storms of life when they don't have Jesus in their boat. You ever thought about that? They have no personal relationship with Jesus. They may believe that there's a God that created everything. They may have heard, yeah, Jesus was born of a virgin and he died on the cross and could answer a few questions. But to walk and to talk with the God of all creation in a daily love relationship, they don't have anything close to that. And I wonder, how do they deal with the storms of life when they don't have Jesus in their boat? Which leads to navigational guideline number three. Because we understand that there's going to be some storms that come up that are too big for us to handle. And we're going to have to decide to have Jesus in the boat. And that means that for the storms of life, we're going to have to have a guide that we can trust. Even if we don't understand him. Now we place tremendous trust in our family and our friends. But they're still human. They're wonderful and they do great but they still have a propensity to be driven towards selfishness and egotistical tendencies. Have you, have you learned in life that occasionally those people that we consider part of our crew, those that we know are in the boat with us, they, they still let us down? As wonderful and as faithful as they can be, they still lack the ability to take care of the storms and the confusion in our life. As much as we love them, as much as they love us, there's things that come up that they can't fix either. And as I've said, the disciples are now afraid of Jesus. And I think it's simply because they just don't understand the full extent of who He is. He's blowing their minds with this tremendous power. And then as He turns and says, Guys, where's your faith? But one of the most beautiful things to me, and I want you to notice, they didn't leave. They stayed with Him. Even though they couldn't comprehend and understand all that he was about. They knew that he had been more faithful to them than anybody else they'd ever known. He said words to them that they needed to hear, not just words they wanted to hear. And he was able to calm storms, not just the one on the sea, but he was able to calm the storms in their hearts and in their minds. So they decided to stick with him. Even though they really didn't understand and years ago, one of my mentors drilled this into my thick skull, and I'm so thankful for it. I trust God to lead me, though at times I cannot trace His steps. You ever been there? Ever been there? God, I trust you. I have no idea where you're going. I have no idea why this is happening. I have no idea did all what's happening but I trust you this is too big for me to handle and I'm thankful that you're in the boat and I'm gonna follow your lead even though I don't understand what's going on I don't understand how my truck works but I, I get in it every day I for sure don't understand how my computer works and everything in the internet and all that but I spend a lot of time in front of it every day. There's a lot of things that God does that I don't understand, but I still am going to place my trust in Him on a daily, bit, on a daily uh, uh, basis. Because I have learned that sometimes God calms the storm, and sometimes He calms His child. 
Sometimes he can calm the storm and sometimes he just says, hey, you're my son. Come here. I'm your Abba Father. You climb up here in my lap and we're going to hold on to each other until this storm passes. And I believe that's what He'd be saying to us right now. I believe right now what He'd be saying to us is just simply, trust Me. Trust Me. I'll guide you through this storm and whatever other storm may come your way. I want you to focus on Me and not the storm. Focus on Me, not the trial. Focus on Me, not the situation. I will see you through. And I claim that promise today. How about you? Now before we have a final word of prayer, three things right quick I want to share with you. First of all, Easter Sunday's next week. Oh, I wish we could fill up the building, but the church has left the building. And so what we can do is invite and encourage others to come and worship with us, join together with us, even though we're separated. They can come here at riversidebastrop.online.church. Service begins at 10. You can tune in just a few minutes ahead. Or maybe catch us on Facebook. The message is getting out. People are excited and, and sharing their comments with us at Facebook about the ministry at Riverside. And I know people are looking forward to when we can come back together because we have new people that are wanting to come and meet you. And that excites me. The third thing I want to mention to you, if you have prayer requests, you, there is a, a link here on this side where you can send those or you can email them to us through our prayer chain that we have set up. But I encourage you to do that. We're going to try our best to remain connected while we're separated. And again, if there's anything you need, anything we can do for you, if you need me, call me. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Jesus, that you're in our boat. We confess to you there's a lot of things that are too big for us to handle. And as we assess who's got our back, who better to be on our team, who better to have our back, who better to be in our boat than the Son of God. And we'll admit to you, Lord, that there's times that you do things that we just don't understand. Things that come upon us and we can't wrap our head around it, but one of the beautiful things about your Word is you've never told us to figure it out. Instead, you just say, trust me, trust me, trust me. So, Father, find us faithful, trusting you. Your track record is impeccable. And that gives us peace as we practice your presence in our lives every day. Father, bless us. Hold us safe. Heal our land. Bless those that are on the front lines. Father God, through all of this storm, we want to give you our unending thanks and praise as we offer it up in Jesus' name. Thank you for worshiping with us today.